It is such an honor, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be here and to participate with you all. I want to give a special appreciation to Chairman O'Malley for reinserting or inserting into the history, the electoral history uh, of the modern efforts of self-determination of Black people, the, the radical, militant components that brought us uh, kept that that spirit alive, I, and I don't say brought us in the universal sense as to where we are because we're in a mess, but that that you all have maintained to get us out of the mess. That is very very important and very critical. Um, I I want to broaden the the. Um, context that we've been looking at and go back, not all the way to the Papa Bull, which I suspect that uh, some other folk will raise at some other point where the uh, battle of the theologians, uh, theocrats um, decided that they could conquer the Western hemisphere and to the extent that they were able to conquer and plant their flag and maintain it, that they would uh, be, in, be in charge, that they, and not only be in charge, but that they would own it. And that the, and all, not just the people, but all the resources that were, that are there and continue to be there, which is the point at which we started earlier this morning. I want to call our attention to the fact that the United States is nothing more than a ongoing criminal enterprise built with stolen labor on stolen land secured by its military status. And when we understand that, then everything that it does makes perfect sense because the fact of the matter is, is, is that you have to have coercion in it, the spectrum of violence from cold violence of denying people access to food, clothing, shelter, clean air, clean water, uh, education, access to technology and leisure, all the way to being willing to blow them up in the middle of the street. You know, the cops in this country kill over a thousand people uh, a year, and it's considered acceptable. Less than one percent of them are ever charged, and even fewer of them are uh, prosecuted and even still fewer are convicted all the way to go to Palestine where U.S. weapons are, are uh, burying people under the rubble where they just use AI to just target buildings um, and, and destroy whole communities with, with one blow. So, the expansion of that, the concept of, of um, control, of the, the globalization um, is, is full, it's uh, in full, full effect. I wanted to, to take us to put SNCC, my experience in SNCC within that context and why I think that SNCC continues to be significant today and an important model for advancement and why it's so important that you all have raised it up. Um, you know, people want to go, they want to skip stick and they want to go to the Black Panther Party, right? The romance of the guns and the, the military appearance, most of the guns didn't work. So it says some, some folk um, or the programs the legitimate, needed, and continuing programs that they actually created, like the free breakfast program, like the uh, free clinics, um, like the tutorial programs, all of which SNCC had. I want to make that clear. SNCC had those two. You had the human rights, uh, uh, doctor, medical, uh, then Mukasa may remember the formal names, but you had the doctors for human rights, who came down south? You had the this, the um, 
nutritional program with Mary Wright Edelman, the, which produced the food stamp program. The, the understanding, the, the, when we say that the victor writes the history and until the, uh, then it's gonna be written in the, fa in the favor of the victim, the victor, that it is critical that we take hold of that. Um, reinforce the effort that you all have already been doing, because not only do you give the history, you analyze the history, and then you give the next steps. Critical, critical, critical. One of the things that SNCC did was to engage in criticism, internal criticism and self-criticism. On um, the SNCC Legacy website, and I encourage you to go there to look at um, the information that is there, some of it is um, mythological, a function of the imagination and the imaging that of, uh, of, uh, for, of and for various individuals in the organization, uh, then and now. Um, but as you go through the papers, you will see, you uh, begin to be able to tell what's real and what's what's uh, what's not. Um, but there, one of the papers is the notes of um, Mindy Samstein, who was one of the white researchers uh, and organizers in SNCC. And in it, he talks about he's taken the notes of a meeting where it, there is a question um, around the formation of the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and COFO, which was a coalition organization. And what was stunting the development of these organizations or these formations and the struggle within the organization, within SNCC, to advance the development of these organizations. And he points out that in general, the Freedom Democratic uh, Party um, idea is best, uh, the best means for building local political organization free of identification and thus control from the national civil rights organizations and us and SNCC. Um, and, and why was that, why was that an issue? Free from our own control, um, which uh, are run entirely by local people, that it isn't run entirely by local people. Our reservations for that, our meaning the SNCC staff's reservations for that, runs from a number of factors. Uh, that the our fear that the local people would not remain militant but become corrupted by the trinkets that could be offered by the power structure. Our resistance to letting, letting go of the race, I think they call it now founder's remorse, um, the need to rebuild, to retain, and to use the local organizations as elevators or platforms for our own aggrandizement. This is internal. It, um, it's criticism and self-criticism, the fear of the loss of our image and thus our prestige. The, um, by using the ra rationalization that if we don't maintain control, then uh, they'll have difficulty raising money um, and, and being respected. However, it was pointed out by someone in the meeting, and that's one thing that's interesting about these minutes, is, is that there are no names. It's just the, the comments and the observations so that it doesn't become a personality struggle. But the fact is, as he points out, that the Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party and other organizations, uh, and COFO and other formations were perfectly able to maintain not only fundraising, but also its prestige and its credibility as you all have manifest throughout St. Louis and throughout Florida and Oakland. Um, so when, when um, the chairman talks about the extension of uh, SNCC uh, and its manifestations 
I feel I feel very honored, and I'm not sure that you don't give us more credit than we're entitled to. <laughs> um, and other other documents there, the uh, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party is a people's organization. That it is to be uh, not to be a civil rights organization, but that it represents the original political efforts and goals of local people. There's a wonderful book um, called Defeating Black Power, and, and I apologize that I don't remember the, the author's name, but he talks about how we shifted from just that ethos to becoming incorporated into the Democratic Party and how it absorbed our goals and our focus and be we became less people oriented and more individual focus. And it, in that transition that we have the betrayal of the masses of our people and of the goals. When we look at um, Look at that that time in 1965, Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party, Lowndes County Freedom Democratic Party, which I, I like to, re, to, set, to remind people or tell others that that cat, that, that Black Panther came from Clark Atlanta University's football team. It was stylized initially by Ruth and Mae Howard, uh, another sneak person, and finalized by Jennifer Lawson on my kitchen table when I was a Spelman student in Atlanta. <laughs> yeah. So one of the things that the goals was to get people to run for office. Um, and so you had local people in Alabama, Mississippi, um, whose names, some of whose names we know, but there were uh, independent parties created in other places. In fact, in South Carolina, it's called the United Citizens Party, and it still exists today. And Cornell West is running on that ballot, uh, ballot line. And of course, that came out of the citizenship schools of uh, Majeska Simpkins. Um, um, there's another woman. Who's that other woman? I, uh, Majeska Simpkins out of South Carolina, and uh, who? Dorothy Cotton. Dorothy Cotton was late. She was toward. She was at the end. There was another woman before Dorothy Cotton. Majeska Simpkins. It, perhaps it'll come to me before before I, I leave, and I can tell you. But Dorothy Cotton was a part of the SCLC um, uh, for Voter Education Project. But out of that was the, the roots of what you are doing today. And to revive that is critical because, it's, because it is the vehicle by which Black power, electoral Black power, yeah. can be re reconstructed yeah. and reclaimed. Julian Bond's running for election was a part of that phase of development. Uh, and maturation of the organization and of that particular um, effort. I would point out also that it was after we had already gone through the Democratic Party had been turned away. Um, and one of the concerns was that um, it was necessary for Fannie Lou Hamer and, um, oh God, her, uh, Gray, what was it, Victoria Gray? Um, that they had to struggle with the delegation to get them to not agree to the compromise, yes. but that as uh, Mother Fannie Lou became known for, that we didn't come all this way for no two seats, all of us is tired, okay? That, that that was the beginning of the effort to split off. You know, Martin Luther King was saying, take the compromise. Yeah. Joe Rao, who was the lawyer for the union and for the delegation was saying, take the compromise. All of them were promoting assimilationist, yeah. re respectability uh, politics, yeah. appealing to the human frailties yeah. that we all have and that poor people not only are, have especially, but that are exacerbated by the circumstances. Julian um, was a modern day 
a symbol of the repression of free speech. In fact, in the the on the SNCC legacy page, and I've, I've, given, I've given the chairman all of these papers that I'm referring to, um, is the SNCC support of Julian when they refused to see him after as uh, communication secretary for SNCC, he uh, read the SNCC opposition to the U.S. war on Vietnam and Southeast Asia, and they refused to, to see him. So the opening line of the statement in support of Julian, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee deeply regrets that the Georgia legislature did not protect the right of free speech in the case of Julian Bosch. Now, yeah. So, of course, ultimately, out of that came the, the Atlanta Project, and I'll say more about that, but also, which successfully uh, ran the special election, and he won the, the special election, and at that same time was the litigation that took the case all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court, led by Howard Moore, his brother-in-law, um, and that was also one, and it stands today as the standard, um, as, a, as a SNCC campaign. Out of that, we began, we meaning the folks on the Atlanta Project, um, began to speak more loudly about where are we, where are we going, what's next. Um, the Atlanta Project was composed of people who were longtime staffers like um, Zahar Simmons, Michael Simmons, Dwight Williams. Um, they had been, uh, in fact, Zahar, who had been a student at Spelman, had got kicked out of school for her activities um, at the same time that a number of other people, professors, have been fired, like Vincent Harding, Stoughton, uh, uh, Howard Zinn, um, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, Stoughton, Lynn, um, and that, other names escape me, but faculty members and other students had been expelled or fired in order to bring the, the, as they would say, the campus in line with the, the orders of, of the day. And of course, the Atlanta Project was, was founded first for in support of Julian. And I'm trying to get a lot in in my, tw what, 20 minutes? Um, how much more time do I have? Um, Ooh, OK. So. Um, so let the Atlanta Project founded um, and led by Bill Ware, who was one of the older members of Air uh, Force veteran and co-led uh, by uh, Zahar Simmons. Um, out of that, we began to take an assessment of what was going on in the world and what was going on in the community and to begin to, as they say, act locally and think globally. And it's out of that uh, thinking that we did an assessment of what was going on and began and did the Atlanta Project position paper, which is the position paper that provided the theoretical underpinnings for the call for Black power. The, the year, we I would point out that the phrase was coined actually, by Richard Wright um, in his book called Black Power, where he did a, a, a visit, went to Africa and did, he did his own assessment of that, whether you agree with it or not, but that's where it comes from. And the year before the Atlanta Project did the position paper, um, the uh, Adam Clayton Powell, um, who's not really thought of very much either because he doesn't fit the mold, um, had actually, he did what? Keep the faith, baby. That, and use what's in your hand. He, uh, he did a formal uh, speech at Howard University uh, Law School. I don't remember whether it was graduation or just a formal speech, but 
he uh, he called for black power. He formally called for black power and said, what we need is mm -hmm. black power. What we need is to be in control of our own lives. Use what's in your hand. And his thing was, of course, that by using the ballot that you could, um, we could achieve that. He wasn't as far sighted as, as um, we needed him to be. And what's more than that, he got confused about who he was and where he was and thought he could do a whole bunch of things that white people do and get away with it. So of course, so so of course he like Fanny Willis got caught in his own hoisted by his own petard. But it was in it was during this time in the fall and uh, following the successful campaign for Julia that the Atlanta Project came together in a common reading group and we were reading everybody including France Fernand. We were reading Emil Cabral. Uh, we were reading Nkrumah. We were reading Che Guevara. We were reading uh, Fidel Castro. And it's that those conversations that the paper is written. Um, the first draft in the uh, latter part of December. We go to New Orleans for what I call the first Black Power Conference. Just give me two more minutes. Well, um, what I call the first Black Power Conference that was organized by um, Bob Moses' ex-wife, Marimba Ani, and her name at that time was, um, what was Bob Moses? Now she's known as Marimba Ani, the writer, the author of the book, Yerugu. Mm -hmm. um, at, at any rate, she uh, uh, organized a uh, conference in New Orleans, and we all went to New Orleans, presented the position paper. The resource people for that conference was John Henry Clark, T.V. Beard, um, and the brother from Jim Campbell um, from uh, South Carolina, and there was a, a fourth person whose name escapes me, and the entertainment was um, the Free Southern Theater. Mm -hmm. And it was held in a, in a small club about the size of this room. We had the whole place for the two days. And it, it was out of that, that the paper, the content, the theory of the paper was tested. Mm -hmm. We went back to Atlanta and said, okay, here it is. You, you all have to deal with it. You all, me and Snick had to deal with it. It took them a while. It got real nasty, real ugly. Um, but ultimately, their own, their own combination of commitment and opportunism brought it together. And Mukasa, along with Kwame, and uh, ultimately Jamil al uh popularized it. Although we, at that time, we were under such, um, such pressures that, um, that um, a, a substantive program was not developed. And that is where you all have come in. Thank you.